Hello everyone. Uh, thank you for tuning in to the third episode of Born in Words, RSIL's monthly book discussion webinar series. Last month, we sat down with Dr. Craig Jones as he spoke about the increasing use of war lawyers by militaries across the globe. Today, we will shift our focus to one of the most hotly debated areas of modern warfare, the use of artificial intelligence and autonomous weapons on the battlefield. We are joined today by, P by Professor Peter Mar Marguiles, who is an expert in national security law and a professor of law at the Roger Williams Uni uh, University. Professor, professor Peter will be discussing his book chapter title, The Other Side of Autonomous Weapons, Using Artificial Intelligence to Enhance International Humanitarian Law Compliance. Our discussion today will be facilitated by Ms. Aisha Malik, Team Lead of the Conflict Law Center and a Research Fellow at the Research Society of International Law, Pakistan. Before I hand things over to our guest speaker, please allow me to share the format of today's webinar. In the first part, Professor Peter will, Professor Peter will, Peter will share the key ideas and outcomes of his research. This will be followed by a discussion between Aisha and Professor Peter before we head into the audience Q&A. Audience members are requested to share their, uh, their questions in the Q&A window. Finally, all attendees are requested to ensure that their microphones and cameras are turned off. With that, I'll hand it over to Professor Peter. Thank you very much, Mubashar. So um, I'm going to talk about autonomy as a safeguard in international humanitarian law. Uh, and I will touch on the more controversial issue of autonomy as a offensive weapon that targets either uh, objects or persons in armed conflict. Uh, but my main focus will be on how autonomy, which I define as using computers uh, to make decisions, right? Uh, how autonomy can actually help promote the use uh, of, of sound IHL, international humanitarian law principles. Right. Next slide. So um, I'm gonna start out with the, what I'm sure is a review for all of you, which is a review of IHL principles and rules. So as you know, IHL balances military necessity and humanity. Uh, so we care about militaries being able to do what they need to do in a war. IHL is not a uh, pacifist kind of set of principles. It, it recognizes that war occurs, that armed conflict occurs, and it seeks to manage that in the interest of humanity. And that's how that second piece, the humanity piece, comes in. Uh, IHL is designed to avoid needless suffering, uh, on, particularly on civilians and civilian objects. We deduce certain principles and rules from this core uh, dialogue between military necessity and humanity. For example, we uh, deduce a principle of distinction, uh, which says that uh, there's no targeting of civilians or civilian objects including cultural property or medical sites. And, and medical sites might include, for example, the Doctors Without Borders or Médecins Sans Frontières a facility that the U.S. mistakenly bombed in Afghanistan, a Kunduz, Afghanistan, uh, in the last several years. A, a tragedy, a calamity, uh, which we need to do everything possible to, to avoid happening again. So in addition, well, distinction, we have the principle of personality. And that, as you know, says that no attack will be permitted when the expected harm to civilians, that is from the standpoint of the commander ordering the attack, the expected harm to civilians or civilian objects would be excessive in light of the military advantage that the attack planner anticipates. So again, you're looking at this from the perspective of the attack planner before the attack. Uh, and then finally, we have the rule of precautions in attack. Very important rule, which says that the attack planner must take all feasible precautions to minimize harm to civilians or civilian objects. By feasible, we do not mean any conceivable or possible precaution. That would be an unduly demanding standard. No one could ever possibly meet that standard. That means no attack would ever be made. And again, the IHL is not designed to stop attacks, to stop war. It's just designed to manage it. But what it does say, though, what precaution says is that uh, if a precaution is feasible, 
uh, if it is uh, allowable in terms of uh, budgetary resources or available technology, then it must be done, right? If it is feasible to do so. Next slide, please. Well, here we get to autonomy defined, which has both virtues and risks. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, autonomy I'll define as software, computers or machines, as we sometimes call them, that choose particular actions without specific, concrete, and direct human pre-approval. Right? So human doesn't directly approve in advance what the software is doing. We also have to consider uh, what technologists call machine learning which is software that adopts to new inputs with new inferences, new judgments, right? Uh, so it, it does something like what humans do, that is it absorbs inputs. And it does that based on what we call training sets. So it's fed data, sometimes lots of data, uh, and it's trained to observe that data, to, to observe patterns in that data, uh, and then to make judgments based on that data, including predictive judgments. That is what will happen next. Right. Uh, that's a, an approach that's been around for a long time. There's a particular approach to machine learning, which is called deep learning. That is of particular interest that I touch on in the piece. Uh, that's a, a method in which you use, again, even greater amounts of data uh, where the computer really absorbed all that data without a lot of pre-direction from humans or pre-programming and then makes judgments, uh, discerns patterns in that data. Uh, and we're increasingly turning to that uh, to allow computers to uh, conduct tasks that uh, humans have done in the past, uh, including reading documents, writing documents, recognizing faces, so that's facial recognition technology, and the like. So the, the virtue of machine learning, including this deep learning approach that I mentioned, is, is, is speed. You can do things very quickly. You can analyze massive amounts of data, you know, thousands or millions, billions even of items of data in you know, seconds or sometimes minutes, far more quickly than a human could possibly do. And you can also cope with many different variables, many different factors, again, scores or hundreds of factors in a very quick way, in a way, way that completely would be beyond what humans can actually do. So you can crunch that data along different axes, different variables in a way that humans wouldn't be able to do, certainly kind of speed. But there are also risks associated with machine learning. Uh, and those have been ex extensively discussed in the last couple of years, but they're worth review here. So one is what we call uh, brittleness. That is uh, a, uh, a, a machine uh, often will make what we'll call sort of silly mistakes, mistakes that are naive or that don't take into account the context of a particular situation. So uh, a, a good example might be, uh, you, you might ask the machine to recognize photographs of an animal, let's say a lion, okay, or a tiger. Uh, and the machine might be able to do that in certain ways, but you might be able to fool that machine easily through using what data scientists call adversarial examples. What's an example of an adversarial example? Uh, well, for example, if you show the machine the image of a lion, the photograph of a lion, but that photograph is upside down, right? The machine might not recognize it as a photograph of a lion that just happens to be upside down. Instead, it might say that's a tiger or that's an elephant or a cockroach, right? Uh, because the machine doesn't have the ability to judge context and say, oh, that just is a photo of a line that happens to be upside down. Uh, and that it's upside down isn't particularly important. Uh, that's just sort of the physical format of the image. The key thing is what the image actually shows, which is a picture of a line. 
Another quick example that just illustrate is a stop sign, right? The universal image of a stop sign, sort of a hexagonal, I guess, six-sided, uh, usually in red. You can fool a computer uh, there by attaching little specks to the sign, just random little specks that a human would discount. Human would say, oh, those are just specks. The stop sign is a little bit dirty. It's not a big deal. It's still a stop sign. But that can fool the computer into believing this is something else. So maybe it's a, a mileage marker, right? Or a speed limit marker, not a stop sign at all. Uh, and of course, you could see that that would be a real problem if you're thinking about driverless cars, for example. Um, the driverless car understands what's a stop sign, including a stop sign that happens to be a little dirty that has a couple of specs on it, you're going to have a real problem in safe operation of those driverless cars. Uh, and then the second risk of, autonomous, uh, of autonomy in any setting is bias. Uh, so in the training set that data scientists put together, unless those scientists are very, very careful, you end up uh, overrepresenting groups and underrepresenting others. So, case in point, uh, you might show in a facial recognition uh, type of, of machine learning, you might show the computer uh, a lot of photos of white people, right, of, of uh, Anglo or American people. Uh, and you might not show the uh, machine a lot of images of black or brown or yellow people. That's going to mean the machine is just not as good as recognizing those images. It's going to make mistakes. Right? Uh, the same way actually people make mistakes often with uh, assessing uh, faces from a different race or ethnicity. Right? So that would be a major problem as well. And you can see that, frankly, if, if you consider uh, using uh, an autonomous weapon to target suspected terrorists, okay? That's one possible use in what IHL calls a non-international armed conflict. That is a conflict between a state and a non-state actor like ISIS or Al-Qaeda, for example. You might uh, have too many images of people who appear to be brown, let's say, or people who appear to be Arab or South Asian in that training set. And that's going to yield mistakes, mistakes that here would be tragic because, you know, they might involve the use of lethal force. So we have to be very mindful of potential bias uh, in the use of autonomy, particularly in armed conflict. And then finally, another risk, another uh, drawback or flaw of autonomy here is what we call lack of explainability. Uh, that is that uh, uh, software can be a black box where we don't understand how the software draws the conclusions it does, makes the judgment it does. Uh, and that can happen when you have to crunch you know, a thousand different variables. How do you explain which variable is most important, right? Uh, a lot of the software, particularly these neural networks that learn through what I call deep learning through thousands of variables, are, are not very good, right now at least, at providing verbal explanations of how they reach the outputs that they reach. Uh, and then so you end up with the machine making a judgment, taking an action, which cannot be adequately explained in, the, in looking back. Uh, and that's a real problem. Right, particularly as you can imagine in a war crime situation where a machine has uh, acted in a way that, that tends to suggest that a war crime occurred. For example, targeting a civilian, a women and children, right? How do you explain how the, that decision, what went into that decision? Well, if the machine can't really provide you with a coherent verbal explanation, you're going to have a problem with accountability. Uh, so that's a major issue as well. There are ways of dealing with that, and data scientists are working on the explainability issue. So there are, there are more and more methods of trying to reach uh, some level of explainability, and explainability AI or artificial intelligence is certainly a very important movement uh, amongst data scientists, but there's still major challenges in that area. Next slide. 
Uh, so, of course, some people then draw the conclusion, uh, which is understandable, that autonomy is a threat to compliance with IHL. Uh, and there are a variety of responses for that, which I'm sure you know about. So some call for a ban or a moratorium on development of autonomous weapons. Uh, and that was uh, part of the so-called killer robots campaign that was launched by Human Rights Watch, the international NGO on human rights uh, in the past, let's say five or six years. Uh, there's a, a, an interesting letter uh, that was discussed in a post uh, in, in on the blog Just Security in the past couple of days by Jonathan Horowitz, uh, an important uh, uh, expert on this who works for the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC. Uh, and Jonathan Horowitz in his blog uh, noted this letter sent by some leading data scientists, including a Stuart Russell, who wrote the most widely used textbook on artificial intelligence, co-wrote it, uh, which says we ought to have a ban even on research uh, on autonomous weapons that specifically target humans. Right? Uh, so again, that, that movement for ban or at least a moratorium that is a temporary ban is very much out there in the public debate. Uh, in, so one issue there is selection of targets. Uh, and that's particularly important in a non-international armed conflict. Who, who, how do you decide who's a terrorist, right? Uh, that's tough, certainly much tougher than deciding on targets would be in a traditional international armed conflict where you can tell combatants by the uniforms they wear, right? But as we know, non-state actors, members of ISIS or Al-Qaeda don't always wear uniforms. Right? Uh, and so telling them apart is much more challenging. Do, do machines have the ability to do that without making tragic mistakes? That's a real question. Uh, and some argue that uh, the goal should be meaningful human control of autonomous weapons systems, right? Uh, and that meaningful human control slogan or phrase has uh, attained a lot of uh, influence and interest out there. Uh, and so one question is, do you want a human being in the loop that is making decisions? Uh, of course, you do that, you don't really have an autonomous weapon, right? Uh, but certainly that would be one option, right? Uh, or you could have what, what we call a human on the loop, which is the human is observed, or at least periodically checking in with the autonomous weapon. Uh, may have the ability to override the weapon, uh, but then doesn't always use that ability and doesn't always pre-approve what the machine decides to do. Okay? So that those uh, two options, human in the loop or human on the loop, are important. Uh, in, in a fully, sort of a purely autonomous system, you might have the human out of the loop, completely out of it. Uh, and, and most people, I think, agree that that would be uh, problematic, that you need at least some human-machine interface uh, to make sure that the machine is complying with IHL. Next slide. Uh, so uh, that brings me to um, the, the question, really, of my paper, which is autonomy and artificial intelligence as aiding in, as helping IHL compliance. Uh, and there, you, you can look at traditional precautions and attack that are taken. Those might include things like taking more time to make sure you, you're targeting the right person, uh, the person who actually is part of an opposing armed force, right, as opposed to being a civilian, making sure. Uh, and you also might want to consult with superiors, superior officers, to make sure that you're doing the right thing, that you're getting it right. Uh, and that would apply not just to the principle of distinction, but also to the other rules we talked about, to proportionality, right? If you think it's possible uh, you could hit more civilians, then you really need to uh, to uh, arrive at a particular military advantage. Or that the civilians that will be unavoidably hit are excessive in light of uh, getting a, a relatively small military advantage out of a particular attack then maybe you should take some more time to think about whether an attack is necessary uh, and perhaps to consult with superiors. So those would be traditional precautions you might want to take. But there are flaws with that uh, and identify those flaws in the piece. So one flaw 
One obstacle to these traditional precautions working the way they should is what I call contingency, that is uncertainty. And that might include the last minute entrance of civilians uh, onto a target site or, or civilian vehicles for that matter. So for example, in that situation, uh, you're targeting a, a vehicle that you believe contains a, a terrorist uh, commander uh, and that vehicle's on an isolated country road and you're focusing in on that vehicle, let's say with a drone. Uh, so the remote drone operator, it might be thousands of miles away, has a camera, and the camera is fixed on that target vehicle. Uh, but that means the commander can't see oncoming traffic, and it might turn out that uh, uh, 50 yards away from that vehicle coming the other direction is a vehicle containing civilians. Uh, it's a last-minute contingency. It can't be predicted, uh, but you certainly like to avoid hitting those civilians if you possibly could. Right. So contingency is one flaw. Another flaw is imperfect information. Information is always bad. Uh, of course, we talk about the fog of war. Uh, information is often very difficult to obtain in a war. A good example of that imperfect information is things like the location of sewer lines. So you might bomb a military target in an urban environment, and it might turn out that there are sewer lines that sort of command all the sewer system in that city that are located right underneath the military target. And when you strike the target, you also uh, disrupt or incapacitate the sewer system, leading to infection, disease, et cetera. That, that problem of imperfect information, you don't know what sewer lines are. And then finally, confirmation bias. And confirmation bias is a particular trait of human beings who are often poor reasoning machines uh, that says, you know, you stick with a story despite neutral or contrary evidence, right? That if you get evidence that a reasonable person would believe to be adverse, you treat that evidence as actually somehow confirming the story you're telling yourself, right? And people are inclined to do that. They're inclined to persist in error. Right? And so that's where a problem, because if you think you're right, you may not even bother taking more time. You may not bother consulting with superiors. So confirmation bias as well can get in the way. Well, how does autonomy deal with that? Well, I talk about a couple of different approaches. Uh, so uh, autonomy can provide more efficient information gathering. Next slide, by the way. Uh, it can also uh, assess the likelihood of changes to the targeting environment. In addition, AI can operators to data's presence or absence. For example, the presence or absence of a no strike list that says you shouldn't strike certain targets like hospitals or important cultural sites. Uh, and finally, uh, autonomy can help you analyze targeting behavior. That is the way that uh, a group deciding on targeting is thinking about or talking about a problem. Uh, and if those discussions uh, show evidence, let's say, of confirmation bias, then the autonomous system can step in and at least alert the participants to the presence of confirmation bias or other flaws, or possibly just stop the targeting until the human participants have put things uh, on the right level. Next slide. So types of what I call situation awareness technology that would introduce AI in this positive way, in this way that facilitates compliance with IHL. Well, one type of situation awareness technology they're referred to here is what I call a gatekeeper application. And that would ensure that operators have appropriate information. And it would send alerts when operators lack information that is really available to them, that they should use, or actually requires that they use. A next uh, application of SAT, as I call it, situation awareness technology, would be what I call cancellation. And that is uh, a sensor or a computer can spot and respond to contingencies, such as the unexpected presence of civilians or civilian vehicles in that oncoming vehicle drone scenario I talked about. And then finally, you can use situation awareness technology in a behavioral application that is to spot flaws in the targeting process and how we talk about targeting. 
and those flaws can include confirmation bias. Next slide. So a case study in this, as I mentioned in my brief overview, is the Messin Sans Frontières, the Doctors Without Borders uh, site that was attacked by the United States in Afghanistan and Kunduz uh, several years ago. So there you had a number of these flaws uh, that were uh, present. So for example, you had contingency. The, the crew of the vehicle, the US vehicle that ultimately conducted the attack, took off uh, in haste because it was at night, uh, there was a pitched battle going on, a very intense battle. Uh, and so they took off without loading their no strike list, which would have included the coordinates of the Doctors Without Borders medical facility. Right? So they didn't have the list, they didn't have this uh, automated list that gave coordinates. Uh, that was a real problem, uh, particularly at night. In addition, you had imperfect information. So the ground force commander didn't know that the crew lacked a no-strike list. Right? And in turn, the crew didn't know that the ground force commander did not know that. Uh, and so you see in the logs of the conversations that lasted over an hour while the crew was in the air before they actually launched the, the missiles at the Doctors Without Borders medical facility, uh, these folks were all talking past one another. They were talking about everything except what was most important. You know, gee, is this really the military target we're looking for, right? Or is it something else entirely, which uh, should be off limits, right? Which we shouldn't target. And then finally had confirmation bias at work in a number of respects. Uh, so both the crew and the ground force commander believed, they, they believed in good faith, they were totally wrong but they believed in good faith that the structure that turned out to be the Doctors Without Borders facility was actually something completely different. Uh, was the enemy headquarters, Taliban headquarters. That was wrong, but everyone believed that during the hour leading up to the attack. Uh, and what did they use as evidence there? Well, they said, uh, we've heard that enemy headquarters has arches, right? Has the architectural feature known, known as an arch. Uh, and they saw an arch-shaped gate on the Doctors Without Borders facility. So they said, aha, that must be the enemy headquarters. Well, if you think about it, of course, that's a very unreasonable view, a ridiculous view, right? Because arches are a very common architectural feature. Many buildings have arches. Uh, countless buildings have arches and probably scores of buildings in an area had arches. That's not a reason to attack a building. But again, the crew and the ground force commander sort of talk themselves into it. That's how confirmation bias works. And then finally, uh, you would think the w one piece of evidence that would be important, one of important data point would be that there are no fires emanating from the Doctors Without Borders facility. That, that is, there's no evidence of, of guns being shot or mortars being shot or rockets being launched from the facility. Nothing in the hour or so that the crew was looking at that facility, right? And you think that's odd, right? If it's enemy headquarters, uh, you, you should see some fires coming out of that building. Right? There was nothing. Uh, but again, an example of confirmation bias, the crew said, aha, that just means the enemy is holding his fire. He's going to start firing us later. He's just waiting for now. Doesn't really make sense, but that was the kind of confirmation bias on display here, tragically enough. And all that set up this horrendous attack, which led to the loss of life. I think 35 people were killed in the attack. The hospital itself was decimated. Again, all uh, for nothing, because uh, in fact, it was not being used as a military uh, installation, a military headquarters by the Taliban. The whole thing was a colossal tragedy of errors, as we'll call it. Next slide, please. Now, how can situation awareness technology address this kind of issue? Well, one thing is, is that gatekeeper application I discussed. Uh, you could note that either the no strike list was on board or that it hadn't been loaded. And everyone would then know that. The crew would know that, and the ground force commander would have access to that same information. No NSL on board. Uh, and you could also then uh, feed the, the model, that is the, the autonomous 
agent here, software, uh, information such as maps, satellite imagery, media reports, and, and even social media postings on Twitter or Instagram or TikTok that would locate hospitals tend to show the location of hospitals or houses of worship or cultural sites. So it supplement uh, what's in a no strike list. You can make that all available through autonomous technology. Uh, then cancellation, we could use sensors to send alerts or even to autonomously halt the operation to stop it cold, as you might do with a precision guided missile that's heading toward unexpected civilians. Right, So you see the missile going toward unexpected civilians, and you could have a camera set up that would see those civilians. You'd have an autonomous agent that would look at the feed from that camera, and then also look at the feed that was directly focusing on the target and say, ah, these civilians are approaching too quickly. They're going to get hit if we also hit the target. So let's abort the operation. Let's stop the operation and possibly do it later, but not right now. The risk is too great. And a computer, because it can process data so quickly, could take all those operations in a tenth of a second in a way that's far more speedy than a human could possibly do. So there's an instance in which a computer could really help in IHL compliance. And then finally, in a behavioral application, we could use natural language processing, that is, analyze language. Uh, and we could also check that against the counts of previous incidents, the flight logs of previous incidents, like the Kunduz attack right, that I just discussed. And you could then diagnose, you could detect confirmation bias and other flaws, and you could at least alert the targeters to that or possibly, again, halt the operation. So there are all ways in which you could use autonomy in a positive sense to assist in IHL compliance. Next slide. So in conclusion, situation awareness technology will not eliminate the fog of war that's always going to be with us. But situation awareness technology could reduce the incidence of tragic mistakes like the Doctors Without Borders attack. Uh, and that would make technology a vital aid in promoting compliance with IHL. Thanks very much. Thank you, Professor. Okay. I will Thank you. Uh, now hand over uh, the mic to Ms. Aisha Malik uh, for a few minutes of moderated discussion before we um, head, hand, uh, head to the audience Q&A session. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, I thought that your chapter was really interesting, the talk as well. Um, it's very interesting as someone who has looked at this from the law of armed conflict perspective, but also on the very much on the side of, you know, AI is bad. This is why uh, autonomous weapon systems kind of undermine key concepts in international humanitarian law to look at it from a completely different perspective. Uh, so I, I found the chapter and the talk incredibly interesting for that reason. Um, at the same time, all of my questions, I think, are going to be <laughs> from the other side. Uh, so I kind of just wanted to start off by asking about how we're going to be seeing more and more trends away from, um, you know, we call this algorithmic warfare as opposed to information age warfare. Um, and it's really going to transform armed conflict as we know it. And, you know, you brought that out through uh, a number of examples. But do you think that we're ever going to see enough state support to get around continued calls for not just meaningful human interaction, but also the retention of human scrutiny, um, what you were talking about, the entire keep a human in the loop model, um, but a preemptive ban in and of itself. And I say this as Pakistan being a country that kind of wants to see a preemptive ban. Um, it's one of those states that is so worried about the start of a global AI race and the extent to which that that would contribute to asymmetric warfare, that do you think that we might just um, be able to see this being nipped in the bud from the off rather than looking at it from your perspective? Well, that, that's a wonderful question. Um, so I, I think those are very important issues. Um, and the, the letter from data scientists that I mentioned uh, that includes uh, Stuart Russell as a signatory, but also includes uh, a scientist named Ronald Arkin, who has worked with the U.S. military. Uh, that, that's an interesting development because it, it arguably shows uh, an emerging consensus that is particularly um, 
worried about using autonomy to target human beings uh, mm -hmm. as human beings. Yeah. Uh, so that letter, which is worth looking at, I, I recommend the Jonathan Horowitz blog post on just security, uh, does actually have a number of exceptions to it. Uh, and, and that is an interesting part of uh, this debate uh, and maybe an interesting clue to uh, the kind of uh, prediction that you're asking me to make here, Aisha. So uh, the, the letter also says that uh, one, we're, we're exempting sort of traditional uses of autonomy, like what I'll call point source uses of autonomy. You might have on a, on a naval vessel, say, that would detect incoming projectiles, right, and, and repel them. Right. Uh, so that's uh, exempt. And that's actually traditionally understood as an exception because that doesn't deal with you. You're not going to have humans flying at a, a naval vessel. It's usually going to be artillery shells or rockets or the like. But in addition, and this is quite interesting, the letter appears to say that you can target other weapons, including guns, like you know, semi-automatic or automatic weapons. Right now, if you think about it, of course, if you're allowed to target those weapons, then you're probably also going to inflict harm on the person holding that weapon. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that is pretty interesting because then you you also uh, create a, a real risk that the, the machine makes a mistake. Right. And uh, it mistakes a, a stick for a weapon. Right or uh, a, a broom that you're just sweeping up with for a weapon. Okay, so if if those mistakes are possible, then it seems to me you're kind of back in the issue of what, what risks will we tolerate in allowing autonomy. Right? Uh, so I I don't have a great prediction. I'm sorry to frustrate you here, Aisha. I think it's a wonderful question. Uh, I think it's still very much up in the air. I do think, however, I, I will say this that uh, I think the, the, the major powers, uh, and by that I include the United States, uh, Russia, China, the United Kingdom, France, uh, I would throw in Israel just because it, it is engaged in a continuing on armed conflict uh, with, uh, with groups that it regards as terrorists, including Hamas, uh, that uh, those folks, those countries and officials of those countries are going to be very reluctant to sign on to a ban or even some kind of moratorium, a temporary ban. It would have to be very carefully tailored, I believe, to get sign on from those countries. And the, the typical position of those countries, which full disclosure, I largely support, is that uh, every country, of course, has a responsibility and obligation to comply with IHL. Uh, but we do that, one, through the testing process, right, through review of weapons under Article 36 of the uh, additional protocol to the Geneva Conventions. Uh, so we got to make sure that a weapon isn't inherently discriminate, right, uh, that, that it, we can control it in a way that some use of it will be consistent with the principal distinction, uh, will mm -hmm. allow us to target the enemy and not, you know, let it loose so it just hurt civilians as well. And a classic example of a weapon that can't do that is poison gas, right? Once you let it loose, it goes where the wind takes it, right? So every nation accepts, you gotta have that Article 36 review. Uh, and then of course, on top of that, you have to make sure any use of the weapon, any deployment of the weapon is consistent with IHL. And these, these sort of more powerful nations that I mentioned, like the United States, have typically said, we must do that, we know we must do that, but that is a sufficient safeguard, uh, as opposed to an overall ban. And so that's why, I, although it's a close question, uh, I, I would say, it, I, I would doubt that those most powerful nations would agree to a ban or even a moratorium. Yeah, I agree. I, and I think that anyone looking to uh, the preemptive ban on blinding laser weapons is for inspiration on that front. I think um, I think it might be a little bit too hopeful. Um, right. uh, my next question kind of kind of touches on um, I want to ask one question, which is purely on the ethics uh, and that will come a bit later. But 
the capability of a constructive system really to make life or death decisions in the absence of human interaction. Um, so I was really interested in your example of the MSF strike in Kunduz and the fact that they were just looking at them having architectural arches and also the soda straw problem uh, in the bombing right. of the Delica Bridge. Um, the, the place where I kind of had an issue with this argument then arose with the... Um, with the IDF's attack on the four boys yep. near the Strip in yep. 2014. So I was looking at that in the sense that there are areas of the law of armed conflict where there is so much uncertainty and confusion, um, especially when we're determining proportionality, right? There are no fixed, real fixed values or a determination really of what constitutes a civilian which is directly participating in hostilities. There's so much uncertainty in the law there. Um, and so I think what, what I kind of struggled about with the... Um, with the archer thing, I was just like, okay, definitely fair. We need more AI to to be able to figure that out. And similarly, also with the uh, with the idea of strike. But but I, I think maybe the area where I differ with you on that is that there should even be an attack at all, as in like, oh, it could help with the legality of the attack. But but actually, there should never have been an attack. And in, in terms of when we're looking at these autonomous weapons, we're looking at the fact that will they be able to give enough presumption of doubt as to civilian status? Will they be able to determine proportionality? Um, will they be able to determine that, you know, a white flag means surrender and the extent to which that is possible? So even these questions that humans are incapable of really doing that well, how do we, how, how are we going to, you know, expect an autonomous uh, weapon system to determine what civilian is or is not uh, directly participating in hostilities when there's so much confusion as to what that that term even means. Well, that's a, another wonderful question. Um, so what I'd say there is, I, I guess I'll talk particularly about the the Gaza attack uh, because I agree that's a very troubling episode. And uh, I've spoken uh, in person to uh, lawyers for the Israeli Defense Force who advise the Israeli Defense Force on international law, uh, and they are troubled by the episode as well. They, they believe that they have developed technological means, uh, as the, uh, the lead lawyer for the IDF said in a published report, uh, that will help reduce the risks that such a tragedy will occur in the future. So what could those technological means uh, refer to? Well, one thing you could do is, is load a, a command center, including an autonomous um, attack model, with images that were actually readily available of uh, the, the seafront Gaza location where this attack occurred. As you probably know, the attack occurred uh, on a, a dock that was actually close to a dock that was widely used, including by foreign journalists. Uh, and I'm sure that folks took photos of kids playing on that dock, uh, because again, there's so many people right there, maybe a couple hundred feet away. So you could load those images on, and then an uh, AI model would be able to compare the size of the images based on markers uh, from that site, right? So you could assess the, the size of an image relative to the dock, say, which has known dimensions, right? It's 20 by 30 feet, say. Uh, and you could compare that then with the size of the images that are seen prior to the attack. And if it turns out those images are small uh, in a way that suggests, you know, it's like four and a half feet tall, has to be a, a little boy, can't possibly be, you know, a, a grown up terrorist, uh, then you would uh, either alert the targeter or you would abort, you'd halt the attack. So that's uh, actually certainly in theory, an entirely feasible way of using AI to address uh, whether or not that attack should have occurred in the first place. And I agree with you that, that that is very much the question for that particular incident. So those are very important questions to ask. Uh, what I would say, though, and this is, I think, one, one objection I have to the, the sort of killer robots approach uh, or um, proponents of a ban or even moratorium, is that one, one has to be careful in looking at armed conflict to be aware that the default position here 
for proponents of a ban is to let humans continue doing targeting. Mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, humans, as I'm sure you'd acknowledge, don't have a very good track record in this area. Right? Mm -hmm. Humans often make mistakes. Humans also get angry. They experience fear. Uh, they, they have all kinds of emotions and biases that get in the way of sound judgment. So one argument would be that uh, a machine, if it's used properly, can at least separate us from some of those emotions and biases. Of course, it has to be used properly. That is always a concern. But we, we don't want to sort of be in the default position of saying humans are fine, because as we know, they're not. They are highly imperfect. Mm. Yeah, and I kind of wanted to talk about um, where machines get it wrong as well. So, so we know that these weapon systems, um, the more that they're being technologically developed, um, we get more of an idea of where they can fail, where they can malfunction, where they can be hacked, which is which is a huge issue because um, we know that also they're not only inaccurate. Uh, you pointed out some examples. One of the ones I recently heard was about how they've mistaken yellow school buses for ostriches. Um, right. And they're also very vulnerable to breaches. And so that comes with it, the whole accountability issue and the issue of attribution. So when yep. they are act, when they are wrong, so say if they if they still said, go ahead with the, um, with the attack on the four boys on the beach, um, where does individual or state responsibility fall then? Well, I think uh, I have written an article about command responsibility that uh, appeared in uh, a collection I think it was from Cambridge uh, or maybe Edward Elgar Press on uh, uh, remote weapons uh, edited by Jens Olin, who's uh, at Cornell. Uh, and what I say there is that command responsibility is still an operational concept and command responsibility is attached to humans. So a human commander has to make it his or her business to mm. ensure that a machine works the way it, it needs to work to comply with IHL, right? And that may well mean that the commander has to have expertise in AI or has to have people uh, who work under the commander's supervision who have expertise in that area, just as we have people with expertise in, in air power or artillery, say, right? It's the same thing. Uh, and then you have, you would ask, are the procedures and the protocols in place for training the weapon, uh, for reviewing the weapon? Uh, are those procedures sound? Are they consistent with, uh, the state of the art in technology? Right? That would be the kind of question you would ask. Now, you would need some way of being able to ascertain the reasoning process of the autonomous agent. And that's where the, the lack of explainability becomes a problem. But there are some ways around that, and, and data scientists are working on that issue a lot. So uh, one example, for example, of how they're working on explainability is to use counterfactuals. That is to say, well, suppose we altered the variables, the inputs that an autonomous agent got, what output would we get then? Right. So if we if we train the agent on different images, would that give us a different output here? Uh, that's the kind of question you can ask right now. Uh, and that will be an important question. Uh, but that then raises the issue, you know, uh, how do you ensure that a state uses a training set that is sufficiently diverse? So you get out of that bias that otherwise would be a real problem. And and so I think that's that's certainly also an IHL responsibility, uh, and it may be a state responsibility under human rights law as well to have a training set that is appropriately diverse, right? So uh, there may be a state responsibility piece as well as a command responsibility piece here. Okay, that's really interesting. Um, we have a number of questions coming in from attendees. I kind of just wanted to ask one last one, which is just sure. about the ethics of this entire thing. Um, so we see many calls from an ethical standpoint against the concept of autonomous weapon systems and the possibility of replacing human judgment with algorithmically derived decisions. And, and the idea that that threatens what it you know, what defines us to be human. So the idea that you shouldn't be killed by an algorithm or that death should be on a human's conscience rather than 
on an algorithmic killing machine. Um, what do you make of that argument? Um, I, I'm a little bit on the fence on this one because I, I mean, I kind of just don't want to die. I don't care if it's done by a human or an algorithm. Um, but uh, we see a lot of philosophical debate about this. So I kind of wanted to know what you thought about it. Well, I'm with you. I, I don't want to die needlessly, regardless of, of how it happens. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that uh, being killed by a bayonet, say, at close range by a human is looking right at me, is better than being killed by a machine. Uh, it, it seems to me the key question is what, what process went into that decision, right? Uh, so that's what I think is most important. Uh, and, and humans have responsibility for that. It may be a, a responsibility is exercised at some distance from a target. But of course, that's the same for traditional uses of air power or artillery, right? Uh, but you still have that human responsibility to make sure that uh, things are done correctly. And if they're not, then to me, the human is responsible. Uh, that also goes to a, a point I see in the chat, which if you don't mind, maybe I'll address, which is, does this make war easier? Mm -hmm. And there my answer is it might, but again, that's no different from artillery or air power, right? That's been that problem, which is a, it's a real problem, but it's been with us for centuries, right? Uh, and we don't see it usually as a basis for avoiding new technology. Instead, we say, when we use that technology, one, it has to be reviewed, so it's consistent with Article 36 reviews, and two, it has to be used in a way that is compliant with IHL. Right, right. Um, I'm going to move on to the Q&A now because we have a number of questions. Um, I will read these out, and then if you, if you could answer them. Um, so, uh, Gassam asks, what are your thoughts on the possible use of AI and autonomous weapons by non-state actors? Wouldn't that end up diminishing the potential IHL benefits of the use of AI? Well, that's a great question as well. Uh, to me, you know, the answer is the same one I mentioned earlier, which is that non-state actors in a non-international armed conflict have the same responsibilities as state actors. They also have to comply with IHL. Uh, and if they don't, then they can be held accountable mm -hmm. through war crimes tribunals and the rest. So to me, that's the big answer there is accountability. Okay. Uh, Rabia asks, issues like confirmation bias should not be allowed to cause indiscriminate deaths of innocent civilians. Are such biases addressed during the training of individuals carrying out attacks using AI? Additionally, is the information given to machine learning technology ensured to be based on well-rounded research, or does the prejudice of the military reflect in it? Again, that's a wonderful question. And uh, to me, uh, a, a, a developer of AI uh, and a commander who authorizes this deployment have a responsibility to make sure that the AI is trained appropriately. That is with an appropriately diverse training set. Uh, and as I indicated, I think that's a state responsibility under human rights law as well. So do, do we do that? It's certainly fair to ask that question. Do we engage in that kind of conduct? Uh, we have to, right? If, if we don't do that, then to me, we can't use the weapon. And if we use it uh, and not do that, then uh, I think that may well constitute a war crime if some tragedy like the death of civilians occurs. Mm. Um, we have a Pakistan-specific question, which is, how effective could IHL have been against the drone attacks in the outskirts of northern Waziristan in the context of U.S.-Afghan tensions, especially post-9-11? I'm not sure whether you're familiar with that context. but uh, to, to, to some extent, I mean, uh, you know, if you're talking about drone attacks in uh, areas that um, are under, I guess I'll say, sort of loose state control, in Pakistan, and that's often where drone attacks occurred, mm -hmm. um, then, you know, I, I think AI could certainly have an important role there, right? In, in one, in making sure that we attack the right people, and we did it in a way that didn't um, cause excessive collateral damage to civilians, right? So um, there, there's some indication, at least some attacks uh, were, were of people who are not combatants at all. Uh, there are people who are meeting for some other reason, but they might have been carrying weapons, but uh, carrying weapons may be routine 
uh, in some areas of the world. In fact, frankly, uh, for some people in the United States, it appears that uh, open carry of weapons is pretty much routine. Uh, and so we want to make sure that AI, like, like people, are uh, appropriately trained to recognize that and to, to make uh, informed decisions about that. So yes, could AI have made a difference there? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Um, we have a question on training data provided to use autonomous weapon systems. Do you think a larger and more diverse reference point is a solution in that data source from a larger number of countries? Yes, I mean, I, I, I think that having more data but also more carefully selected data so a number of data scientists who have highlighted the issue of bias, uh, and I include uh, Timnit Jabru, who was recently, uh, very recently fired by Google in what I think was a, a very unfortunate uh, mistake by Google, uh, and arguably discrimination. Uh, she said that in an important article, which is called Stochastic Parrots, Stochastic Parrots, uh, is that uh, we have to curate training sets to make sure that they are appropriately representative and diverse. Uh, and I think uh, as long as curation itself is done in a fair and equitable way, uh, then that might be a very important piece of the puzzle here. Mm. Um, I wanted to, uh, so there's a question in the chat as well, um, and it's using uh, the driving analogy that you, you used in the chapter. Well, imagine you're driving and all of a sudden an obstacle is in front of you. You can turn right and hit a wall that would destroy your car, or you can turn left and hit a pedestrian, which would kill the person, but prove to be much less costly from a financial perspective. A human might be able to make the moral decision to sacrifice his car and save the pedestrian. On the other hand, if the car was driven by AI, it might use predefined algorithms and calculations and end up killing the pedestrian to save the car. Keeping this example in mind, as well as other examples from the past, such as the 1983 Soviet nuclear force alarm incident, where a human being decided to ignore the Soviet nuclear early warning system, do you not feel that the inability of machines to make moral decisions is a substantial factor that should deter the use of AI in the battlefield? The short answer is no, and here's why. I, I don't think it's really a, a, a moral decision that is required by the AI so much as that it is training that must accommodate those moral questions, uh, which are also actually legal questions. So in the armed conflict scenario, uh, you, you, you would probably sacrifice a machine to avoid killing a human, and you can train a machine to do that. Uh, to deploy that machine in, in my model, you would have to uh, know, you'd have to reasonably know that you would train the machine successfully to make that kind of human-centered judgment. Right. And it's the same thing with the, the Soviet Union example that was given in the chat. Uh, there you, you would train the machine. We already do that with humans. So, for example, as you probably know, the U.S. in Afghanistan had rules of engagement. And yeah. those rules of engagement often had thresholds for civilian harm that were more demanding than what the U.S. believed the laws of armed conflict required. So many operations would be what is called CD1, or collateral damage one, which means if, if you expected that a, an operation would kill more than one civilian, you, you couldn't do that operation, couldn't do that attack. And you can program computers to do that as well, to have that kind of threshold. Okay, yeah, very interesting. Okay, thank you so much. That was such an interesting discussion. I really, really enjoyed reading the chapter and your talk. And I think given um, the participation from attendees and the amount of questions that we got asked, I, I think everyone enjoyed it as well. Uh, so thank you again. I'm going to hand over now to Mubashir to just close the talk. Aisha, thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone, for being part of our conversation today. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Peter, for taking Thanks to everyone. Time. Wonderful questions. I wish we had another day to discuss them. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much for taking out the time um, uh, to be a part of this conversation. Uh, with that, I would like to formally uh, close the uh, close the webinar. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, take care. Have a good day. Thank you.